Mm. I told you here about a week ago, I had, a, actually last Wednesday night, I think, I had a dream, and I saw myself teaching and preaching the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, from memory, uh, epistles of the New Testament. Back in 1980, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background for those who are also going to be watching this YouTube. Uh, back in 1980, 81, I was really basically, I guess I was complaining to God. I was saying, God, where, where are the Pauls, the apostles? Where are the Peters? Where are the James? Where are the Johns? Where are the Stevens? And he, he spoke to me. He said, they're still here. I said, Lord, what do you mean they're still here? And, and he said, they're, they're in their epistles. They're, they're in, in the writings of the book. So, so that, 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 that was a declaration that the word of God is a bag of seed. Now, uh, last week I was talking about the divine DNA, how God created the earth. It was just nothing but mud. And when he spoke, let there be. Uh, and all of a sudden here came the grass, the trees, the flowers, the plants. Then he spoke, and here comes the animals. Every one of us, just look at each other. You came from one seed. One seed. Many seeds were released. Only one seed made it. Many seeds have been released. It says uh, broad and wide. Many be which go in there at the way of death. Straight and narrow, and few there be which find it. If you are truly born again and if you've made Christ Lord of your life, you, you and I are so, so privileged. So privileged. We are so blessed that we had hearts to receive. Man was made from dirt. God breathed in him to the breath of life. He became a living soul in the likeness of God or the image of God, but not the likeness of God. Then what did God do? God gave him a bag of seeds. What did he give him? He gave him words. He did. He gave Adam words. I don't know why Adam didn't take. He took the word of taking dominion over the animals because he caught all the animals before him. And God stood there and watched him. And he gave names to all the animals. But when the devil came, uh, speaking through the mouth of the snake, that word wasn't in his heart. The weapon. See, the word of God is our weapon. I am totally, completely, absolutely now convinced that this is God's DNA, he gave it to us. I'm totally convinced. It, it overwhelms me. I'm totally convinced this is the DNA of God. That this word will not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate there in day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written there. And for then you will prosper and then you will have good success. This is the DNA. Now we've been corrupted by the DNA of the devil. Uh, every, every soul that sins will die, and, and sin is the DNA of the devil, just like righteousness and holiness uh, is the DNA of God. Uh, we were born of one seed, not many seeds, as of many. The promise in Galatians says the promise wasn't to many seeds, as the, 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 when it talked about your, your seed would be as the stars of heaven or your descendants, it all comes from one seed. It all comes from Christ, which is Christ. Christ is the seed that was planted into the soul of our hearts when we believed and received the truth. See, that's how this word becomes alive inside of us. It's the DNA of God. It produces the divine nature of God, the character of God, the personality of God. So since this is the bag of seeds, now really there's only one seed, that's Christ. Or you might say it this way, all the rest of this is a part of Christ, because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by the Word, and without the Word was nothing made that was made. Listen, we cannot be any more than what the Word of God is real to us in our lives. I'm not talking about being born again and again. I'm talking about our, 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 our walk of faith. Uh, faith comes by the Word of God. We, that's one way. By the acknowledging of every, I've got a book back there that talks about how faith comes 28 ways. But I'm really, I'm really having a revelation, I'm really having a quickening of, of realizing this is God's divine DNA that he has given to us to cause us to become exactly like him. What does it say in the book of Peter? It says, by exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow, it's the word of God, people. 
So really, the most difficult thing there is as believers, the most difficult thing there will be is not praying, not going to church, not even paying tithe. The most difficult thing will be for you to hide God's word in your heart. Because the enemy, he knows that's the only thing that can stop him. I'm going to say again, the only thing that can stop him is the word of God. Now, what's amazing, as you put the word of God within your heart and it becomes alive to you, all of that power, all of that authority, all of that creativity, get a hold of this now, is not released in quoting scriptures. That, that reality is released by the name of Jesus. So it's all in there, and you say, in Jesus' name, every scripture that you've hid in your heart that is real is immediately released in that area. It's a mystery. It's the greatest mystery that there has ever been. That God said, when God said, let there be life, he didn't give, he didn't name every bit of life there was. But in his word was all of the seed for every form of plant life, every form of fish life, every form of animal life. So the, the, as you begin to put the word of God into your heart, you begin to uh, hide it in your heart and you begin to meditate on it day and night. And all of a sudden you're in a situation where all you can do is cry out, Jesus, God shows up. It was like the time that my wife and I were on a motorcycle, a little F, uh, a, a 450 Honda and Dan, Mikey was in between, Kathy was like seven months pregnant with Danny, pretty big. And Mikey was sitting between us, two years old. And we were coming back from doing visitations in Chambersburg, coming down 997. And I, I knew there was a shortcut, and, I, and, and, I, and the sun was in my eyes. And I saw the shortcut, and I turned off, and it turned out it wasn't the shortcut. It was uh, just a pullover for semi-trucks. And doing on a motorcycle doing 45, 50, it was nothing but gravel road. And, and, and it was supposed to be gravel road. It was gravel road. When it hit the gravel road in front of me was a great big heavy steel guardrail, was a big pile of ballast rocks, and was a telephone pole. Now, this all happened in a matter of seconds. I knew from riding motorcycles since I was a kid that we were in big trouble. When, when I hit those rocks, hit that guardrail, and hit that, I knew in my mind right away, I knew that Kathy probably was going to lose our baby and that we were going to be all mangled up. And all I could do was cry out. All I could do was say, Jesus! And when I said, Jesus! It was like there, there was this invisible uh, uh, catcher's mitt. And it was like an angel was down on his knees. I could see it. And I hit this catcher mitt like a, 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 a pillow of, of feathers. And we felt it. And then it was like two uh, pillows off to the left and right. We stopped on the dime. I didn't even put my brakes on. And we fell over into like a bed of feathers. And Mikey didn't even cry. And we're laying there under the glory and the power of God. And, and I didn't have time to quote, he gives his angels charge over us to protect us in all of our ways. No weapon formed against us will prosper. It was just all of that scripture that had been in my heart that the Holy Ghost could got, give confirmation to that in my heart. He could give confirmation to it. Think about this. What if, God forbid, what if, what, what, what if a person gets gloriously born again? But before they got born again, uh, they were born dumb. They couldn't talk. Couldn't he hide the word of God in his heart? Does, the Bible says even before you call, he answers. He answers you because he knows what's in your heart. As in your heart, you reach out to God. So this is the DNA of God. I'm telling you, it is the DNA of God. And when you first plant seed... It seems dead. There's life in the seed, but there's a process. It's got to get into good soil. It's got to have moisture, the Holy Spirit. It's got to have light from the sun, right? It's got to have heat. As I was musing, the fire burned, and then I spake with my mouth. I spake with my tongue. So I really believe, and, 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 and you know, I don't look to be critical. I look to get fed on the Internet. I look, and so I hear like somebody said to me today about all these wonderful speakers that are going to be up in Harrisburg. And I thought, well, hey, you know, praise the Lord. So I began to look them up, 
And I began to listen to them, and my heart was so heavy grieved. There was no emphasis of God's word. You're not going to get this thing done without God's word. Uh, he sent his word. He healed them. It, it's got to be the word is quick and powerful and sharper. All things began with the word. Everything is sustained by the word. He upholds all things by the power of his word. Why, why are, now, he said to Peter, Peter, do you, do you love me? He said, yes, do what? Give my people my word. The Holy Spirit comes to give us the word. Not your feelings, not your opinions, not just, now I don't mind sharing experiences, I just shared one, but it's all based on the word. It's just, it's there to fortify, it's there as evidence. See, here's the evidence that God's word is real. He does protect, he does provide, he does lead, he does guide, he does speak, he does help. He is there, but it's all based upon the word. And, and if I'm not taking people into God's word, then I'm, I'm leading them into no man's land. I'm, I'm leading them into a place where you might be awed and amazed at my revelation, but revelation that's not based upon, there is no greater revelation than this book, people. There is no greater revelation. And, and then, of course, I told you last week, I saw myself preaching the epistles, and the Lord said to me, he said, uh, the people of the world are smarter, and this is what Jesus said, those of the world are smarter than, than the people of my church. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? He says, from kindergarten, preschool, all the way up to college, when you, when you get, they'll give you a book on the subject. They never flip that book. Now, I'm talking about New Testament, okay? So don't get caught up in the Old Covenant. You cannot understand the Old Covenant until you, 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 you partake of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, we're, we're free from the law. Well, let me explain what they're talking about. We're, we're not talking about the, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. You're not free from that. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's still, that's a part of God's nature. What are we free from? The Levitical laws. Do you know why? Because Jesus fulfilled them all. Jesus was the fulfillment even of the feast days, the holy days. The new, it says that in Colossians, let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath day, for all of these things are fulfilled in Christ. He's the fulfillment of all the Levitical laws. But so in the book of Galatians, the whole book of Galatians is written to Gentiles that the Jews who were Judaizers, Judaizers, were those who confessed to know Christ, but they didn't want to let go of the old covenant uh, Levitical laws, physical circumcision, all of this stuff. And, and he actually calls them enemies of the gospel because they come in and they take you out of trusting in Christ and, and, and moving in the spirit. Now you're so busy, touch not, taste not, handle not, do this on a certain day, do that on a certain day. And guess what? Your mind is not on Christ. Your heart is not on Christ. And so they, what, they, they actually, what happened, they stepped out of the realm of the spirit, the fruits. And now he said, take heed lest you devour one another. Now they're in strife. They're fighting over what day is the right Sabbath and what kind of food they should eat and how they should dress and what's the length of their hair. I mean, just on and on. See how the devil works. But that's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That, that, that I, I was trying to tell you the difference. They said, no man ever spoke like this man. Do you know why? Because all the Pharisees, they were teaching Touch not, taste not, handle not, worship days, feast days, new moon days, sacrifices, plus they added 300 more laws on top of it all. You know what? Jesus didn't teach any of that. He didn't teach none of that. They said, wow, we've never heard this stuff before. What are you teaching? He says, I'm teaching you the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm showing you how things that have been hid before the foundation of the world that angels themselves wanted to look into. He said, now I'm telling it to you, those who have ears to hear. Not everybody has ears to hear. Hearts to receive. And he began to share the mystery. So every epistle, I'm telling you, every epistle needs to be looked at and read from beginning to end. Beginning to end. So as you, as you first, I've always encouraged, especially new believers, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And start with Matthew. 
See, the Lord just showed me that. You know, I've always emphasized the four Gospels because that's how I got born again. When I first got born again, I began to just, but I didn't know where to begin. I had a little military green Bible that was basically New Testament. I think it had Psalms and Proverbs, and I would just devour New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we told people through the years, hey, you need to study the Gospel of John if you just got saved. And the Lord corrected me. He said, son, no, they should have started in the Gospel of Matthew because John is deep waters. They're not ready for deep waters. They have no idea. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, abide in me, my word abides in you. Hey, that, that, you understand, that gets close to the very end of the book of James, chapter 17. And then, of course, he's betrayed, he's crucified, he's resurrected. That is, that is meat. The gospel of John is meat. And it just gets thicker and heavier, more powerful. But you got to build up to it. Uh, your education, your spiritual education would not be solid and stable and, and deep if you don't Build up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you get into the epistles. Ephesians that was written to the church in Ephesus. And Galatians to the Galatian church that Paul started. And the Corinthians and the Roman church and Colossians. Now them books are not really in order in the sense that they, they, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were written to the churches. That's what they were written to. And James, now Peter, he relates with James. And as we look in the book of James tonight, line upon line, precept upon precept, we're going to work our way through it. We're not going to get very far tonight because it's so deep. Every epistle, oh, so I could spend a month teaching on Ephesians chapter 1 alone. Oh, there's so much meat, so much revelation, so much a revealing of, of God's purpose. But James was the brother of Jesus. And, uh, but when he begins in James chapter 1, he said, James, a servant of God. So the very first thing he emphasizes is servanthood. Now, as we look at the book of James, you got to kind of back up. So what I want to do is I just want to mention some of the words. And you know these words are in the book of James. The word patience is in the book of James twice. Now, there's five chapters in the book of James. They're very brief, but they're very powerful. And in, in the original Greek, there was no chapters. It was just one letter, it, like a love letter written. So the na- now, we, how do we know it's about Jesus? Because he says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So right away, we know it's written to believers, and these believers were scattered because of persecution. And matter of fact, Peter said that to, to, to the 12 tribes. And, 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 and Peter talks about this because persecution came to the early church. And the early church did what the Bible said to do. If they reject you in this city, go to the next. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, don't stay there and let them kill you. He said, if, he said, matter of fact, dust the feet off. Get the dust off your feet and just go to the next city and go to the next city. And it says, wherever they receive you, they're receiving me. And so they did that. The early church did that. They had a, they, they, because now it's, it's really it sounds strange, but the early church was free from worldly entanglements. For in other words, it, remember when Lot's wife didn't want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah? And because of it, she turned to a pillar of salt. See, Jesus, now I'm here because God put me here, and I know I belong here because I've tried to get away from here over and over. I've tried. Now, some other people, it's the opposite. God wants them to move, and they go, I'm not going nowhere. This is my home. This is my town. This is where my roots are. And they die there. But the 12 tribes are scattered abroad. And so James, the very first thing, he doesn't call Jesus my brother. He calls him Lord, right? James, the servant, that means a, a bond servant, a slave. That's how he looked at himself. He looked at himself a slave. So the word patience is twice. The word Jesus is twice. Christ is twice. Uh, the word Lord, well, we'll talk about the word love is three times. The word joy is two. Now it's going to start getting a little bit heavier. The word Lust, L-U-S-T, in the book of James. He's talking to the 12, he's talking to the, the believers now. If you've heard the doctrine that when you got born again, the old man died, that is a lie. You've got to crucify the old man. Paul said, I die daily. I mean, how, how in the world, it boggles my mind. I guess people just don't know the Bible because I can't listen to this stuff. 
because my mind goes right to the word. I'm not trying to be critical, but you understand this is my weapon against deception. The greatest, the greatest enemy of the body of Christ other than demonic powers is the twisting of the Bible. Twisting of truth. So people, when you, I, I know a friend of mine, I don't need, I won't, I used to support him, I won't no more. He got into this doctrine that, uh, well, uh, sin isn't in your flesh. Excuse me? It's not in my flesh. Then how come I've got to crucify it? How come I got to mortify it? How come I got to deny it? How come I got to say no to it? How come I got to come against it? It's all through the New Testament. So the word lust is six times. That's desires of the flesh are against the will of God. Uh, the word sin is seven times in five chapters. The word faith is 11 times. The word work is 15 times. The word Lord is 13 times. And the word God is 13 times. So one thing you can do is what we call the exegesis is, it's not J-E-S, it's G-E-S-I-S. -E an exegesis of, of a manuscript, that means like if you're going to do an exegesis, and this is what they teach in Bible college and stuff, like if I'm going to do an exegesis of Ephesians or Galatians, or, that means I'm going to do an overall picture of it, and I'm going to try to, it means to, to lead out of. That's actually what the word means. It means to lead out of what? Lead out of darkness into light. It's you're looking at it and you're studying the whole context in order to find like when you sign a contract, if you end up in court, they will exegesis them documents and see exactly what is it that you signed and what you agreed to. This is our covenant, people. We should know what's in it. And, 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 and there's such a blatant ignorance today of the scriptures and there really shouldn't be. You know why? Because we all have them. We all have a Bible. And if you'll ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. It's not the understanding of your mind. You, you ask the Lord. I, I've asked the Lord all my, ever since I've been saved. Lord, show me what this means. Not leaning to the understanding of your mind, but knowing that God will quicken it to your heart because the, the natural mind cannot understand the things of God because it's spirit and spiritually discerned. So he says, James, a servant of God, I'm a slave of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he brings himself underneath the lordship of Christ. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? And you'll see this throughout the book of James, where he emphasizes this submitting to God, this surrendering to God, this yielding to God, this giving yourself to God. He'll, he'll show you this. And actually, at the very last chapter, he says, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him... Let him know that he that converted the sinner from the error of his way, so save a soul from death, and shall hide a mother to the sins. He's not talking about a quote-unquote unborn-again person. He's talking about a born-again person who went astray because of wrong doctrines, and he has to uh, repent, and then he'll be forgiven. That's, isn't that amazing? You can't be born again again, but you can be converted be converted over and over <laughs> you can walk, fall down and get back up so it said james the servant of god and lord jesus christ and then he's to the 12 tribes 12 that's the seed of abraham isaac and jacob 12 the believers the people who got born again you know on the day of pentecost all of all of the the seed of abraham the devout men the devout men were in jerusalem for the day of pentecost they all, I mean, 3,000 got born again, 5,000 got born again, got filled with the Holy Ghost. Persecution comes, of course, and, and they begin to scatter. Because they were all staying in Jerusalem, man. That's where the glory of God is. That's where the revival is. But persecution comes because of the word. Realize that when you begin to hide God's word in your heart, and you begin to see God's word as the DNA of God, and you, begin to, and you begin to cherish it. God looks for those who tremble at the word. Did you know that? That's what it says. God's looking for those who will stand in awe of the scriptures. We don't worship the scriptures, but we recognize that this is what God's given to us in order to bring us into oneness with him. You can't come into oneness with God without the scriptures. You can't. You can't. That's why the devil's got to keep you away from it. I'm telling you, you ought to read the word of God, whether your mind agrees with it or not. You ought to tell yourself, Father, whatever the word says, that's what I did as a 19-year-old kid. I was never taught Bible. 
I said this. I said, God, whatever this says, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe it. And that's how I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said, well, they spoke in tongues. I never heard anybody speak in tongues. Never been around Pentecostal people. I said, oh, the Holy Ghost is going to make me a witness. Holy Ghost, come in me. And the Holy Ghost came. Out of my belly came a new language. Started speaking in tongues, and my speech impediment was gone, and I've never shut up, right? <laughs> okay? Except when my time is up. <laughs> to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Greetings. So now they're being scattered because of persecution. My brethren, he said, count it all joy. Count it what? Consider it joy. Consider it. Count it all joy. Why? When you fall into diverse temptations. Now, these diverse temptations, it's not really even, even though we could say temptations could be persecution because when people are under persecution, they're willing to compromise to save their life. But really, the, the temptations we're talking about here is the enemy, he's, he, he, he's, he's going to be messing with your flesh, trying to get you out of the will of God, get you out of the will of God. Why? Because if, if, when you're out of the will of God, you're taken captive by him at his will. He takes captive of you. Jesus said, the prince of this world comes. He can find nothing in me. Now, can you imagine? Now, we're, we're not hardly just two scriptures in the book of James. It's packed full of truth that will cause you to live victorious in this life that the Holy Spirit will use. All scripture is given by inspired by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Scripture, the word of God. Thank God we have it. There's countries in the world they don't have it. And it says, uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Don't grumble about it. Don't gripe about it. Don't complain about it. Don't, don't. God, I don't know what's wrong. I've got so many temptations. Don't count it all joy. Why? Because the only way to overcome temptations, tests, and trials is by faith in Jesus and the word of God. So you're going to have to exercise faith. That's why he says, consider it joy, because now God's ultimate purpose will be fulfilled in you, because now you've got to use faith to get the victory. You've got to. You don't have no choice. Above all, taking the shoot of faith, wherewith you shall be to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So we don't see it that way. So when problems come to us, hardships come to us. Okay, so last night, here's a good example. I don't know if I have the story complete, but my daughter-in-law, Yuli, she was about 100 miles away. And uh, she pulled into, uh, she did one of her gigs. She does face painting. She pulled in, and she heard a hissing. Her tire went flat. Well, it's pretty late at night. She has no help. So she, she, she was listening to a Christian program called God, a God moment or a God where you could call up a God moment. She looked across the street and she seen some men. She went over there and said, I need help. They came over and changed her tire for her. She caught up the radio station and said, I just had a God moment, whatever it was called. And she testified over the radio live how God was just there for her in that situation. Well, that may seem minor to some people, but see, that is the trying of your faith. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Endurance, patience. See, what is patience? Patience is like, you know what a mighty oak tree is? It's just an acorn that held its ground. A mighty oak tree is simply an acorn. How many of you have ever seen an acorn? It held its ground. When all the other acorns are carried away by the squirrels or they got washed out by the wind or the rain or they, 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 they didn't go deep, that acorn, it sunk its roots deep. Patience is sinking your roots deep into God, not caring whether you feel it or see it, just knowing God can't lie. That's what patience is. Patience is endurance. Like, I don't care. I don't care what my body says. God's word says I'm healed. I, I don't care what it looks like financially. God says my needs are met. I, I don't care what it looks like when it comes to how many people are here tonight. His word will not return void. That's, you. See, God is really, and, and, and James had this revelation. Of course, you know, James was martyred. They killed James, the brother of Jesus. But he had this revelation. God, God, God isn't concerned in 
what people call success. Success to him is you being grounded and rooted and established. The, the wind, he gave the parable, uh, you build your house on the rock, and actually the Greek says you dig into the rock. You know how hard it is to dig into a rock? They didn't have dynamite in those days. They didn't have jackhammers. They had a hammer and a chisel. Busted their hands, and they would bust some of them old castles. I've seen them in Europe. They build them on sheer rocks, and they have been there longer than when Jesus came to the earth. And they're still standing to this day. I mean, we got buildings in America that are only a couple hundred years old. I mean, in Great Britain, I went to castles that have been there for over 2,000 years. They built them on a rock. And that's what he's talking about, building your life upon the rock, Christ Jesus. And it says, knowing this, that you're trying of your faith work with patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. What do you mean? Wanting nothing. See, this, David had this kind of re reality. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It begins, Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, Paul said, I've learned how to be full, and I've learned how to be hungry. I've learned how to abound, and I've learned to suffer need. I can do all things. He said, the circumstances, I'm still the same person. I'm still the same person no matter what. Uh, I, I'm not moved by it. It is what it is. If I'm in jail, I'm praising God. At midnight, they were praising God. You know what that was? That was patience being exercised, endurance. Paul and Silas in prison, praying at midnight. And they're crying, oh, God, how come we're in here? No, they know who Christ is. They know that it don't matter. In the body or out of the body, it don't matter to me. God, if God before you, who can be against you? We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. I mean, this is an amazing life. Sunday, I want to talk about what... What causes God to come rushing towards you? There are certain elements in your life. If they are there, it will cause God to come rushing towards you. Because God is looking. If you got the wrong elements in your life, it will cause demonic powers to come rushing towards you. And I've seen it over and over. I've seen people didn't know what they do. I saw where they were headed. And I said, I, I saw destruction was coming. I saw it. Why? You, because there are certain things you dare not do. Because you just open the barn door for the devil. Uh, I, I know Lester Summerall said this. Lester Summerall said a person can destroy a whole, their whole life for Christ with one wrong decision. One wrong. How many people have gotten themselves killed because of one wrong decision? It happens every day. People, you know, texting on their phone. Runs across the highway and gets hit head on by a, a, a Where was God? You made the wrong decision. You're not supposed to be texting when you're driving. But you made that decision and you opened the door for the devil. It ain't God. It's the devil and you opened the door. The Bible says give no place to the devil. And he's going to talk about this. But notice, if any of you, now verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, if you do lack wisdom, did you notice he said, you all lack wisdom. He said, if you do. You know why he said, if you do? They should not have lacked wisdom because they were Jewish people and they were raised with the truth. The wisdom we're going to look at tonight for just a little bit is truth. Truth. God, I want truth in my inner being. Not just here, I want truth in here. See, it, it's not that I need to get a new revelation. I need to have the truth that God's already given me to become alive in my heart. That's what I need. Now, maybe I, there, I don't know the scripture yet. Because actually the Bible says, and, and when Christ rose from the dead, he was telling those two men he was walking with about what the Messiah was doing. And it says, and they did not yet know the scriptures. For in other words, they might have known them here, but they weren't alive here. See, I know the scripture. I know the scripture. By his stripes you were healed. I know that scripture. I had a businessman today because we were talking a little bit back and forth and he began to try to convince me. Well, uh, Pastor Mike, you better get insurance. You better get health care insurance. I said, listen, I've lived my whole life and so has my family without it. I don't need it. What do you mean you don't need it? I said, I'm not saying you don't need it and I'm not putting anybody else down. 
I said, I don't need it. Well, how come? And then I, I took him. I went and got my book on him. I said, because I got a revelation that by his stripes, I was healed. <laughs> Anybody can get that revelation. This is the way. If any of you lack wisdom, God, I just don't know. I can't get healed, Lord. I just don't know. Ask for wisdom. Lord, okay, give me wisdom about what's going on here. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men. How many? All men liberally, exceedingly abundantly. God will give you wisdom. See, all you need is wisdom. Say, all I need is wisdom. All I need to know is how God sees this. What has God said about this? I know what the world says about it. I know what most people say about it. But God, what do you say about it? I tell people, I've told them, for opinions are like noses. People put them where they don't belong. I don't ask people their opinion about, now if I get around people who I really do know God in certain areas, because you know what, I might know God about in the area of healing, but maybe I don't know God the way I should in the area of relationship with my wife, or maybe I don't know God the way I should about finances. You see what I'm saying? You can have a revelation of healing and not have a revelation about how to treat your wife. Or how to submit to your husband. <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> or, or how to obey the laws of the land. Now, I, I, I had a friend of mine. He, he, he went on a crusade. Uh, uh, because based upon the Constitution of America. And he had like seven kids and a nice farm. And he refused to pay taxes anymore, right? And I went to his, I went, to, he asked me to go with him up to Harrisburg when he was going to go before the judge for tax evasion. And they brought him out, a born again, spirit filled, Holy Ghost man, come out in an orange uh, jumper suit with his arms in handcuffs, his legs in handcuffs. And he comes out and he quotes the Constitution to the judge. And away he goes to prison with, 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 because he got on the wrong crusade. Jesus said, remember, when Peter said, they, they, they're complaining, uh, Lord, because you're, you're not paying taxes. Well, legally, they shouldn't have to. They're, they're free people. But he said, lest we offend them, go take a fishing pole and a hook and a string. Catch a fish. The first fish you catch will have gold in its mouth. Pay your taxes and mine. Isn't that amazing? It's all right here. If you lack wisdom, it's there. What did you? But I couldn't talk him out of it. I said, brother, why? Why get ripped away from your wife and your kids and lose your farm? Not because you ain't got the money to pay taxes, but you say the Constitution says. No, I'm willing to die for this, but I ain't dying for that Constitution. <laughs> you know, truthfully, I, I thank God for I guess for Second Amendment rights, but that's not my crusade. They come and want my guns. They can have them. I'm not going to die for the guns. Now, if they come and tell me I can't preach Jesus, I'll preach them. <laughs> and let's see if they can kill me. I don't know. <laughs> can you say amen? Yeah. So if you lack wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all men liberally and, and, and a brave thought. It will be given him. Say it will be given him. So come on, man. We, we're, only <laughs> uh, we're only in verse 5 and I'm already out of time. Reach up and grab the wisdom. Grab the wisdom. He'll give it to you in abundance. Okay, so how let, we could spend a whole time on another hour on just this. So you need wisdom. Okay, so where do you go to get wisdom? Right here. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It, it's a light to my feet and to my path, a candle, right? Here. I need wisdom. Here. Don't go to a psychiatrist. Don't go to the world. Go to the book. Say, Lord, show me now. So don't, don't try to force it in. You don't, you don't push a square peg into a round hole. It, it'll flow. Wisdom just flows. Uh, like, you know, here some years ago, I had two attorneys that bought our mortgage because we had fallen behind because they had made a mistake and not released our, our lien against the property we sold across the street and no bank would work with me. And that's where I was. I borrowed money because that's where I was. You know, and there's times I have borrowed money spiritually and that's where I was when we put up this building I didn't couldn't borrow no money and we we're fifteen thousand dollars short when the when the when the metal pulled up outside and a man drove up and gave me a check for it. the next year I was five thousand dollars short I put this addition on over here and a 
a guy drove up in the car and handed me a check for $5,000. Okay? But if you're not there, see, one thing I do, you got to, it says, if you are in the faith, you got, okay, where I'm at. See, that's where Jesus always said, you ask me. You ask me what you want me to do. Where are you at? Because that's where God works with you. God, if you're in kindergarten and there's nothing wrong with being in kindergarten, and don't try to jump kindergarten and go to college. You're going to be completely confused and lost. you got to build line upon line, precept upon precept. It's taken me 44 years to get where I'm at right now. And, and, and probably, if you saw in the realm of the Spirit, I'm sitting in the corner on a stool with a dunce hat on. <laughs> I'm talking about from the early church. The early church, they were so much more advanced than we are. It, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, but we're coming. Say, we're coming. Grab that. So... How do you, how, so if you lack wisdom, you say, okay, God, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Okay, notice, it tells us what he's talking about. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. For in other words, it was never in his heart, it was in his head. See, faith is when you know that you know that you know. You know it. You know you're born again. You know you're washed in the blood. You know God loves you. How do I know God loves me? Look at Jesus on the cross dying for you. Took your sins, took your sicknesses, took your diseases. I've never doubted God's love for me. Once in 44 years, I've doubted my love for him, which is a legitimate concern. And I say, Lord, I can't love you. Help me love you. And you can't love Christ in your ability. I hope you, how many of you find that out? You can't love God in your strength. You need his help. God, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help to love you, God. You know, I wish I could actually take about just 20 hours and teach this thing all the way straight through. <laughs> but it says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is going to be driven with the, I know God loves me. Oh, no, God don't love me. I know I'm healed, but I don't know I'm healed. I, I, I know God says he'll never leave me, but I feel like he's out with me. See, you're going to be, and you're going to be unstable. Double-minded in all your ways. This double-mindedness is revealed to us through the whole book of James, all the way up to chapter 5, where it talks about, you adulterers and adulteresses, knowing you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, who will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Submit yourself to God. Now resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In every situation, isn't that wonderful news? I'm telling you, the, every epistle is packed. This epistle, if you just, so what do you do when you ask for wisdom? Well, uh, prayer supplication with? Prayer supplication with? That's, you got to jump into thanksgiving. If you cry out to God, you speak to the mountain, and you don't begin to thank God and praise God, that's the one way that faith comes, through praise and worship. Faith will come as you praise Him and you worship Him. Think about this, because if you're not praising God and worshiping God, you're most likely praising and worshiping the problem. Most likely. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all corruption and bitterness and anger and wrath and, and, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This all connects together, people. This is like one flowing river. But because we haven't been being taught the word of God, right? We got a piece here. We got a piece here. We got, it's like a thousand piece puzzle with 10 pieces. And you can't figure out how it works. It's all right there. So you could, as a homework assignment, you could take the book of James and just begin to read it real slow and just go over it and over it and say, Lord, give me wisdom. Let me see how it connects. Let me see how, Lord, you show me. You're my teacher. You're my wisdom. God is our wisdom, our righteousness, and our sanctification. So we're going to close here, but I want to go just a little bit deeper. A double-minded man is unstable in what? 
How's, that means you ain't going to be consistent. You ain't gonna, God has rewarded them who diligently seek Him. You're going to be up one minute, down the next. You're going to be faithful a minute, unfaithful next. You're going to be a giver and then not a giver. You're going you're gonna to pray and then you're not going to pray. You're going to read your Bible and then you're not going to read your Bible. You're, you're just going to be double-minded. And it's really your choice. It's really because you, 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 here's the wisdom. I just don't understand. Here's the wisdom. Here's the wisdom. It's right there. Be a doer. That's why it says in James, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Who are you deceiving? Yourself. The devil even de- you're deceiving yourself. I just don't know. No, just begin to do the word. Well, I just don't feel. Ah, it's not about feelings. It's about faith. It has nothing to do with feelings. Do you feel saved all the time, Pastor Mike? No. Do you feel healed? No. Do you feel like God loves you? Do I feel God loves me? No. Do I feel like I'm going to make it to heaven all the time? No. But I learned a long time ago, feelings are fickles. They're fickle. They're not fickles. They're pickles. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't. Who cares how I feel? Who cares? I, I, yeah. He loves me. He can't lie. God is not a man that he should lie. Call out of me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. People don't have faith that God will answer them so they don't pray. Well, God said, I can't lie. He said, if some don't believe, it doesn't change me. I, I, I abide faithful. Aren't you glad that God's not double-minded? He's the father of lights. No verb and just neither shut up turning. Um... Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Now this, as we get into this next time we gather, this is so powerful because now he's going to talk about the wealthy and the poor. And you know what he says? Wealth has nothing to do with faith. I know you're going to be taught otherwise. Yeah, if you had enough faith, you could have wealth. No, because he, he says, hasn't God chosen the poor of this world? Rich in faith? And heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him. So here's the real faith. Faith is for the, and, and it's through the book of James. Faith is for the apprehension of the divine nature of God. It's not for material things. Now you'll have to believe God for material things to get the job done. You, you, you know, you might need uh, this or that. And God will take care of it. But really faith is taking a hold of the nature of God, the character of God, the personality of God. And then faith is used, listen, faith is used to say, no, I don't need that. No, I don't need that. You know, uh, through the years, there have been times I got sucked up with material things. And, uh, but there's been times, like I was going to buy, buy a plane one time, I was a pilot. Got it all financed, had it all lined up. York Airport was going to make the payments. They needed, they needed a nice plane. I found a nice plane from a flying uh, club in Shippensburg, a, a 172 Cessna. Nice. Totally financed. Bank said yes. Got this, going to get this plane. Arranged it with York Airport. They're going to make my payments. I'm going to get the fly free. And one day I'm in prayer, and I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, if you buy that plane, you and your whole family will die in it. I wasn't in the spirit of fear. It was God. And I said, and also he told me another thing. My brother-in-law had a four-wheel drive truck, F-250. He said, and if you buy that truck, he said, not only will you lose every penny you put in it, but he said, you'll lose basically all your money. So I decided to test God. I said, you know what? I'm not going to take a chance with my wife and my kids dying. So I canceled the contract. I mean, I walked away from it. it could, I, now, I could have even said, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy this plane. I just won't fly it. But how many know the temptation would have been too great? I would have flew it. So I didn't get the plane. But it, and I, so I went to buy this truck from my brother-in-law, Bill uh, Schooley. He told me, he said, Mike, you don't want this truck. I said, no, I want this truck. He tried to talk me out of it. So I bought the truck, right? Well, transmission went out right away. 
engine went out. So I'm sticking all this money in, and I finally thought, okay, God said I'm going to lose every bit of money plus. I said, I'm going to sell it before I lose my plus. So I sold it to this guy, as is, right? As is. It's gone. I, 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 I got $300, you know, praise the Lord, uh, out of, you know, after all my expenditures, I might have not lost $300 out of 1500 Well, a couple of days later, he's knocking on my, frame, uh, my door as mad as, he said, this truck, the frame is bent. I said, I sold it to you the way it was. You sold me a truck with a bent frame. Guess what? God's word was fulfilled. I said, hold on. And I went and got his money. <laughs> God told me I'd lose everything in that truck. And he was right. And another time, a woman came to me, a widow lady, and offered me her, her brother was going to go to prison. He had a real nice big yacht down in the Baltimore Harbor. Pastor Mike, I'm going to give you my yacht. I don't want it. Here, here's the title. And the Lord said, don't you take that yacht. I walked away from it. It took faith. No. Another time somebody gave me a big boat on the Mississippi River, and I heard the Lord say, don't take it. And I said, no. Now, I could have sold this stuff, but I heard the Lord say, no. Another time somebody was going to give me a twin beach. Uh, 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 I think it's called a beach. Uh, it's a big airplane, a beach, not a beach nut, beach something. And, and you know what? The Lord said, don't take it. And I turned it down. See, it takes faith to say no. Not faith just to say yes. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. How many of you ever had, how many have to use faith to say no to the flesh? <laughs> All the time, right? How many times, have you ever said no to something that looked really good because in your heart you knew God is saying no? Did you get something tonight? Well, Father, I thank you that the teaching and the preaching and the proclaiming of the word that's gone forth tonight, though we didn't get very far, there is full of truth. And I thank you that word will not return void in Jesus' name. Amen.